Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to another inspirational interview on Artful Minds. My name is Michael King here. I'm your host. And Artful Minds is an online artist community where we focus on the artist's artistic development and growth through exercises, communication, demos, and the beginning of some master classes, which I hope to expand. And our inspirational interview today is with Kathleen Hudson. She's an oil painter who emphasizes her dynamic light and atmosphere in her paintings. Uh, she's also a signature member of the Plein Air Painters of America and the second youngest ever to be elected to the fellow in the American Society of Marine Artists, which I can think would be a hell of an achievement. So uh, welcome, Kathleen. Thank you very much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's a joy to be here. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen. and I want to go through some paintings of yours, but at the same time, can you just take us through your journey of becoming a painter? Yes. Well, I started painting incredibly early. Both of my grandmothers were artists, so that was helpful. Um, and my parents really encouraged me. They they were deeply supportive and bought me art supplies. And I watched um, in the last few years a video that my grandfather was taking at Christmas on an old fashioned camcorder in the probably in like 88. And you can see my mom in the background telling me, you know, Kathleen, look at here, take this present, put down the pencil. <laughs> so even early on, I was, uh, I was, you know, constantly to be found with a pencil in hand. So that did start early, but my, my parents also got me into art lessons early on. They had a friend who was a Latvian artist and um, he, he gave me lessons in drawing and watercolor. So that started when I was six. And then when I was 12, my grandmother convinced her weekly workshop instructor to let me start painting with the class in oil. Oh, you can meet my daughter here. So I I'm telling them all about how I got started painting. And I started drawing when I was around your age. And, and so, and then what happened? Well, Nori and Grandian, you know, my parents, they, they got me into lessons. And then my grandmother got me into oil painting. And so, you know, the kind of paint I use downstairs? Wow. in the studio that's oil paint so i i got started in oil painting at age 12 which was pretty early and the sure. that decision was prompted by <laughs> what happened next um i got to visit my aunt who lived in washington dc or and it was during that giant sergeant exhibition that traveled throughout the u.s in the late 90s and so i saw that and i thought okay i have to try oil because this just looks so fun and tactile and so i i started painting in in oil shortly after that and really haven't looked back i occasionally will dip into some other mediums at times it's been a little fun to try out gouache recently but i do love the fact that oil has so much texture and that's mm. that's something i enjoy employing in my my paint my journey in terms of subject matter is also kind of interesting. So I I did not go to art school. Um, after I wrapped up doing workshops with my grandmother in the middle of high school, that was the last formal instruction that I had. So I I just kept painting in my dorm room and then studied medieval history and literature. Oh, interesting. And so I ended up focusing on pilgrimage and how people would travel through the landscape. Is there are all these different narrative accounts of medieval pilgrims? using the landscape as sort of a parallel for a spiritual journey where they would go through difficult or dangerous places or make a long, you know, have a long journey with a, a destination in mind. And so I, I wrote my, my thesis in undergrad on mountains as sites of spiritual journeys. So, so it's kind of funny because it ended up being more applicable to what I do now than yeah. I would have guessed. Yeah, so I ended up studying that. And then after I graduated, I was considering law school, but it was right at the, it was during, during the 2009 financial meltdown or in the aftermath of it because I graduated in, in uh, June of 2009. And so I, I thought, you know what, I want to put that on hold. I don't want to apply and jump right into grad school. I would rather, um, you know, I'd rather see if painting works out because if I can do it right now and make it work, then it should be able to work anytime. <laughs> so I, uh, so yeah, instead of, instead of uh, going to law school, I got started painting and joined the Copley Society in Boston and sold paintings. And it, you know, it was tough starting out at that point without solid gallery representation, but it, it worked. And so I was able to use that as sort of a launching point for the rest of my career. At that point, I, 
I didn't really know many other working artists. And I think that was the biggest challenge of not going to art school or having any kind of, you know, formal workshop mm -hmm. training at that juncture in my career. So I, I had some painting experience. I kind of knew, I, I knew what type of painting I liked, but didn't know anyone who was um, working and making it in that field, especially in landscape painting on a full-time basis. And so it wasn't until I got started doing the plein air events that that really changed. And so that, that happened when my husband and I moved from Boston to Kentucky, where I grew up. And I thought, okay, I don't know anyone now here who paints regularly and paints outside. So I should look into a way to meet people. And so I resubscribed to Plan Air Magazine and found out about Plan Air events. Um, nice. I think I'd known a, a little about some events because I subscribed to American Artist as a, you know, back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, you know, of course, the events weren't as widespread as they are now. And so in 20, yeah, 2013, 2014, when I resubscribed, um, I found out about these plein air events. And <laughs> so I registered for one in Indiana and then went to a, one in Augusta, Missouri and loved it. I mean, it was like meeting my tribe. Um, so I, I really was able to kick things off through the plein air events and gain some collectors and find a lot of good community. A lot of my best friends are fellow artists who are part of the, the plein air painting community. So that, that has been a huge joy. And that was honestly what, that, that was the biggest thing in my career trajectory, because I think without the events, it would have been really challenging um, mm -hmm. to rely on kind of the traditional shows and, you know, and gallery owners and, you know, just, it, it's, it's difficult to get to start out, especially without an existing network. And, yeah. and the, the events gave me that. Yeah, it's a whole different game in the States because you do have a lot of plein air events. And yes. I can just imagine what it was like for you being, you know, learning from your grandmother and then moving on to the, in Boston, learning uh, or continuing on with your painting a little bit, but not really having anybody around. And so it sounds like Kentucky was a great move for you. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> it, it was. And it's you, funny right? because there's not even really much of a plein air event. You know, there, there is a an event in Kentucky that's high profile, but there are a lot of artists who paint outside. And I, I know that exists in Boston too, but I just, I, I had enough of a community there that, you know, from school that I didn't really have an incentive to go out and find fellow artists. I also didn't know it existed. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was yeah. news to me to find out that this whole community was, was out there. I just, I kind of thought what I did was a little weird because I never <laughs> saw anyone else doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I remember hearing in a previous interview that like you're around 14 years old and you should, you used to just go outside with your watercolors and paint. Totally, I plan air yeah. painted all the time, but you know I didn't even know what it was really called at that point. Well, of course, it, you know people just call it whatever they want, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did not, I did not know that this wider community existed. That's so funny. Now, how what how big an advantage do you think you've had? Not so much over other artists, but just in general towards painting because you started so young your understanding of drawing with your aunts and, and, and everything like that. I think that was huge because mm -hmm. I, I learned, you know, it, painting is really about seeing more than it is about the application of paint. All of that stuff is secondary and it, you know, those are skills you can pick up, but what, what makes somebody an, an artist is, is how they view the world and mm -hmm. then how they communicate that visually. And so I, I, by starting early and because my, you know, I was homeschooled. So my mom and you know dad and grandparents took a really active role in making sure I traveled. That was the main reason I was homeschooled was that my mom loved traveling. She was an Air Force brat and uh -huh. she, she and my grandparents took me to all 50 states by the time I was 12. Um, my aunt and uncle were based in, um, near in Oxfordshire in the air force. And so we went over and stayed with them for a couple months at a time and wow. traveled around Europe. Saw a lot of the UK, especially. And wow. so I, I had a really wide ranging experience, even by the time I was in, you know, in high school and had been to hundreds of art museums. So I think being in museums was probably uh, the most significant part of my art education, because 
I it developed my eye for how you know how good paintings can be put together mm-hmm. and you know what what designs in a painting stand out from across a gallery room what textures are really interesting to get up close and look at and and so things like that I learned to appreciate from an early age because I got to go to so many art museums for sure now do you use that as an influence for your current pieces like you remember some sort of texture that you saw in some museum you think I'm going to apply that here because it's it's going to make this so much better oh totally yeah Yeah. I think oh you know I I haven't done brush with snow behind it before like you know who Mm. who have I seen that handled that really well and you know I'll go look it up the nice thing about having you know the museums mostly having their their uh, works uploaded in high definition now is you can remember something and go back and look up a really high definition version of that painting on you know on the museum website now and and see it up close again so I've I've done that quite a bit. I mean, that's, you know, there's nothing, nothing totally new under the sun and creativity and art is really more about synthesizing everything that you've seen and applying it to your own vision, uh, you know, of, of the subjects that you choose. So I, I love looking at what, you know, how people have solved visual problems over time and, and seeing, you know, got up before sunrise to do this hike. So. Yeah. And I would say when looking at a lot of your works you're really into atmosphere right <laughs> that is true. Everything, everything has this sort of mistiness glow to it and i think you do that a la prima too you don't go in with any glazes afterwards do you very rarely you know occasionally if if i notice that something about my key in my painting is off if i've mm. done it plein air then i will go in with you know neo mcgill or something and and glaze it in the studio but mostly i try to do that on location in the way that that you can pull a lot of atmosphere into your work on location is to just be really careful of your values um, and think about how as elements of the landscape recede they are lighter in value i mean even th- this wall behind me is a little cartoonish <laughs> it's just a, a but mural. yeah it illustrates the fact completely it's kind of like the, yeah, yeah exactly like that so you can see how it, it um, there's nothing about and this is it's two colors of paint I just got a white bucket of paint and a navy one yeah and it's the only thing about about these mountains that are that's changing in, in subsequent layers is the value and it's still it has some atmospheric distance so I think a lot of times we focus on texture and color and the things that stand out more immediately to us in paintings but yeah. value does all the work <laughs> that's right that's right so, uh, so I, I really focus on that when I'm out in the field Oh, for sure. And I'm going to, I want to, you're talking about value. So I want to bring up one of your waterfall paintings here. Sure. And when you talk about waterfalls in your other interviews that you said, it, it's it's all about values. And well, everything's about values, really. But for waterfalls, especially because you have the sun kissing off it, but everything else is quite very gray. And I thought I'd want to show this because you can really see how gray you make your waterfalls with only a touch of lights. Can you talk about the waterfalls yes. a little bit? Totally. Yeah, I have a, a DVD coming out on waterfalls um, this, oh, nice. this month, so coming out pretty soon. Um, but I, I love that subject because you get to design um, with value much more directly than you do with almost any other subject. Um, and if you look at my palette when I paint a waterfall, it's a lot of grays and browns and you know some cool grays as well. But it it almost looks like kind of a, a boring color palette by itself. And then when you go, you know, but when you put it all together, what you can do is you can find areas of, of color shift. And I, what I'll do is I'll amplify those once I've got the value structure laid out. So you can see where the sun is catching the light on the falls. There is some warmth along mm-hmm. the edge of that shape between the, the lightest light and the shadow again. And yeah, there, it, there's a lot of warmth there. You can see some cooler blue. And again, that's, you know, it looks like a bright blue next to some of those warm tones, but it's actually a gray that's shifted a little bit towards blue. Mm-hmm. And and so I look for for some color shifts right along the edges of different shapes. And I try to amplify those when I'm painting. And that's where the color, you know, the feeling of color really comes from in a waterfall subject that is a lot more about value. Yeah, yeah, because you lay in quite dark values beforehand. 
and then slowly build up to the lights, correct? Yes. Well, and I frequently do a value underpainting in oil. So I don't I don't let it dry. I mean, it's it's a transparent painting where I kind of sc scrub in, you know, in a, a neutral to warm tone. And then I paint over it mostly. But I, there are areas in some paintings where I will leave elements of that underpainting visible, especially in the transparent darks, because those feel a little bit more rich and luminous than if you necessarily go over everything with opaque paint. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love doing underpaintings where I have the, you know, when I do that, I have the value already mapped out. And that is extremely helpful because then as, you know, if I've got my values on the canvas, um, I can mix paint with more confidence. I can lay it on with more confidence because if the underlying value structure is good, it's a lot harder to mess up a painting. <laughs> So I, I find that that's a really helpful way to go about it. Yeah, you're kind of exploring the subject first in fact, and then afterwards you're just applying the colors on top, right? Yes. Um, now this piece, I think it's about 18 by 24. It's fairly large for a plain air piece, actually. And I and I think your story with this is, and I got some following pictures, is this is a 10-mile round hike up to Timberland Mountain? Yeah, Timberline Falls. In, Falls. Yeah, it's in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. That's right. And the end result, you have a really good story with this piece, which <laughs> I'd like you to tell. But also, this piece won you the Plain Air Salon only after you submitted it for the second time. So if you could talk about both those things, that'd be awesome. Yes. Um, yeah, I submitted that one. You can see there's the, I did a value sketch ahead of time just because I knew the light would change during the day. And I, mm -hmm. Because of the the round trip hike requirement, I knew I wasn't going to be able to make that a two session painting. Um, so I wanted to have that mapped out um, so that I could finish on site that one time. So yes, this is up at Timberline Falls and Rocky Mountain National Park. I had waited for the better part of the two weeks of the Planner Rockies event to do this painting because I needed to do it on a day when we didn't have thunderstorms in the forecast. Uh -huh. And of course, in August, in the Rockies, almost every afternoon, there's a thunderstorm. So uh, we finally had a day that was clear and I, the hurdle that I ran into was that my, it was a 14 by 18 and my 14 by 18 panel holder broke. So I bought some twine at a hardware store the night before and ended up tying my panel holder to the outside of my pack. So that was how I was going to get this painting up and down. And so I, yeah, so I hiked in, you know, it was pretty, I, I don't remember much about the hike. I remember being beautiful, but it was pretty uneventful and did the painting and it came together pretty quickly. Um, it, it did help to have the values mapped out or to have that thumbnail sketch um, on, on hand as well. And then around probably, I don't know, maybe 4.30 or 5 p.m., I thought, okay, I need to get rolling to get back down this, <laughs> this mountain before it starts to get dark. And I, I noticed that the crowds up there were really thinning out too. And I, I didn't want to mm -hmm. have to solo hike down without people around because that's just not, you know, not as safe. But I I strapped the the wet painting to the back of my pack facing behind me <laughs> and started down the mountain. And it was actually pretty easy going. I was a little nervous because there were some people on the trail who would, you know, would uh as if I passed them or they were coming up to pass me, they would make comments about the painting and a couple of people tried to, you know, like reach out and touch it. And I was like, no, 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 that's wet. <laughs> oh, please don't touch. But the the real the real nerve wracking part came when I was maybe three quarters of the way down, two thirds of the way down, I forget. And there was a section where you, you know, you're hiking along the side of um, of a ravine. So there's a there's a ravine on one side, kind of a steep hillside on the other, and there were a couple of tourists from the Czech Republic, and that they I, I knew them because they had stopped and talked to me while I was painting okay. up at the falls. And I saw them going off trail and I thought, that's strange. And then I looked, I, I looked closer and realized that they were going to take photos of an elk calf that was about six feet off the trail. 
And I thought, oh no, this <laughs> is gonna be bad. And sure enough, the elk cow was right? was like in the brush right next to it, and she was obviously getting uh, getting concerned. So yeah. she was, you know, stomping around a little bit and snorting. So I yelled at them to get back on the trail and get away from the calf. I think they just thought it was like deer, you know, that it, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was a risk, but. Um, elk are obviously different, different animals. Um, so I, yeah, so I yelled at them and it, luckily they listened and they got back on the trail and kept going. Um, but then the elk didn't really move. So I thought, okay, I don't want to walk past this very irritated elk cow. <laughs> so I, I sat down for a little while and, you know, took a, took a water break and then they moved off the trail a bit, but still not a lot. But I, I thought, okay, well, it's getting dark and there really aren't that many people left on the trail. I need, I have to get down the mountain. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, well, it, it can't be that bad if I just walk calmly past where they, these elk were now about 15 feet off the trail <laughs> and, 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 you know, mind my own business. Um, so hopefully that will be all right. Um, so I, that's what I did. And then I heard something rustling behind me, like right after I passed the place where they were and the elk cow was following me. Wow. So she tailed me down the mountain for about, about five minutes and it felt like an eternity. I'm sure. Yeah. You always check <laughs> so, over your shoulder, right? Yeah. Well, and what, I, I just kept going at my normal pace. I didn't want to run or startle her. Or, so I took a photo of her over my shoulder. <laughs> just a second. I've got a daughter interruption. Here. Okay, sure. Well, we're taking a little, little unscheduled break here. You can find Kathleen on the internet at KathleenBHudson.com. And if you're on Instagram, you can find her at Insta on Instagram with her handle being Kathleen B. Hudson. And of course, with Artful Minds, you can find us at ArtfulMinds.ca. And if you want to see more inspirational videos, you can find them at Community.ArtfulMinds.ca. Here we go. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> oh, man. And so I guess in the end, you made it down the mountain okay, right? I did. And yeah, so she, she tailed me, the elk calf, uh, cow tailed me for about five minutes and slowly peeled off as she realized that I wasn't trying to pose a threat to her calf. <laughs> it was, it was nerve wracking. And the fact that I, I was worried for me, obviously, but it occurred to me that the wet painting was facing backwards. And like <laughs> later I reflected that it was kind of funny that even at the time I was thinking, oh man, that was one I liked. <laughs> <laughs> like, if she if she decides to to charge, then uh, that painting's probably not going to be long for the world. <laughs> no, no, that's your protecting that whole backpack, right? I guess. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's a good thing that it didn't, right? Because exactly, end, and I, of course, at the time, I had no idea that painting was going to be as impactful as yeah. it ended up being. But <laughs> that's right, because you used that painting as an entry to the plein air salon once. I did. And obviously, nothing happened. And um, then... Well, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember when I, yeah, with, I've noticed with the salon, it, it, you know, since they have different judges every, every time, it really just depends on who you get, what they're drawn to, you yep. know, what, what they like. And <laughs> so it's, it's worth trying a couple of times. If there's a painting you really believe in with, you know, with a competition like that. And I've had the same thing happen in the years since so there was a painting that, um, that I entered into the OPA and I, I thought it was, you know, significantly better than ones I had entered before that I'd gotten in and it did not. And then I entered it in the California art club gold medal show and it won an award. So I thought, okay, well, <laughs> that, was, that was meant to be. <laughs> so you, you never know. And if, if there's a painting that you really like and believe in, you know, if you have doubts, you know, if, you, if you think that maybe the painting was rejected because there's something about it that you're not seeing, then, you know, you can always send it to a friend, um, mm -hmm. you know, who's, who has a good eye for things like that. I've, through the course of planner events, I've built up a network of, of friends who can give me a, a second look at a painting if I have a question about it. So that's been helpful. Yeah, for sure. Those fresh eyes, right? Yes, That's right. totally. Yeah, and so <laughs> for those that don't know, when she entered it a second time, um, I don't know what month it was in, but you ended up winning a grand prize and fifteen thousand yes. dollars. So it it pays to re-enter pieces. It seems right. Don't be <laughs> discouraged, does. right? It does. And actually, look at the judge. That's another thing I've learned. You know, with something like this, where you do have the option of waiting a couple months mm -hmm. and you know seeing who else is on the schedule, go ahead and look at who the judges are. 
on the schedule and see if there's somebody who might be more, you know, more drawn to a specific piece of yours. Um, because you can see, you know, if it's a gallery owner, what kind of work do they have in their gallery? If it's another artist, what kind of work do they do? Um, and of course, you know, there are lots of artists who are not going to pick work that necessarily looks like theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, it can, it can help shape your decisions in terms of what you submit to different shows. Oh yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Use their I try bias. not to ever paint to the judge. <laughs> it's a challenge at planner events for sure. Yeah. But, but when it comes to actually picking what to submit, it's, it's totally fair game to, to think about what the judge might like. Yeah, that's good advice. That's good advice. <laughs> now, when you're plein air painting or even just when you're in the studio working off your photos and studies, yes. what, what do you look for in a scene? Do you, you know, do you look for the composition? Do you look for the shadows? Do you look for the light? Do you yeah, anticipate really the depends. light? It depends. I mean, for me, it tends to be the whole scene that draws me. Oh, mm. you got another interruption. Hang on, Justin. No worries. Another unscheduled break. Uh, in the chat, I also did post Kathleen's uh, links to Kathleen's information on her website and Instagram. And a little note from Scott Jones. I have a hard time thinking of anyone turning down one of your paintings. Lol. I have to agree. Everything I've looked at is just amazing. This one especially. Let's see if I have time to bring it up. Out of all her paintings, I think this one has to be my favorite. I'm going to have to ask her what size this is. I can't remember what it is on her website. But just the way the, the sky wraps around with the beautiful cool and warms coming through and how it's all reflected on the water. And you got your, you know, your mid-greens that are bright but aren't too bright. And how everything just cools off as you come down. You know, you do have your warms within these cools to offset and create a little bit of interest, but uh, just the, the way the lighting cascades over this landscape, I find just amazing. We'll just keep on looking at some of her work just while she's away. This one's fascinating too, and this is all about broken color or how I like to call it, temperature shifting. You have this overall green sensing of a mountain, but you have a lot of blues, some greens. It comes across primarily green though, but you have a beautiful cascade of violets in here as well. And a lot of gray, colored gray neutrals, splashes of light blue. Same thing applies for the front foreground area in the sandy path. This one's absolutely stunning. Uh, I don't know if it's plain air or not, but if it is, she capped the light really well. Can't imagine trying to capture Chase's light with plain air. All right. <laughs> oh, you're all back. Now I totally forget what we're talking about. So we'll just move on to some of the uh, participants' questions here. Yes. One of them wants to know if you're doing any workshops this year. You know, I, I have one on the books in Carmel, California, and I need to see if I can make sure that happens. But um, with twins arriving in May, I did kind of clear the depths. I can imagine <laughs> I for sure. I have a feeling that it's going to be a little, a little more difficult to travel. My, you know, in the past, I've been able to travel just fine with the two kids because my, with my mom and my mother-in-law have been great about diving in and helping mm -hmm. um but with uh with twin infants that that would be asking a lot <laughs> i'm gonna have to be a little more choosy this year no don't you can wear a double backpack and just have them on your back while you're painting <laughs> all right what i might see. do is if i find a good place in colorado springs i might add something to the schedule here just so mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anybody has to travel a significant now, I see like a lot of your plein air pieces, they're 18 by 24, maybe a tiny bit smaller, but sometimes larger as well. I have to say I'm jealous because 9 by 12 is probably the biggest I end up doing. How do you become so proficient at painting so large in a two-hour period outside? Some of it is just practice. Um, and, and the events definitely help with that because you mm. have to do, you know, when I go to planner events, I'm painting from dawn till often past dusk. And I know I have to come up with a body of work that will be on display. And so the motivation to go a little bigger outside was in part from seeing what other people were able to do outside and realizing that it is entirely possible to paint larger mm -hmm. and and so that was that was helpful and then also i you know as i've progressed in my career i've raised my prices on my paintings and that was a way to do that at plein air events you know to to like keep the pricing higher and to still you know to have a painting that was high impact is to to raise this or to actually increase the size that i was gotcha. working yeah because that way i could kind of you know keep keep the plein air um or keep the the paintings in my standard pricing yeah it, it, and what i found is that as i've gotten bigger now i feel like i'm compressed when i paint smaller so it, once you get used to it then it becomes more habitual 
Yeah, I can imagine. Um, there's a lot more room on a bigger canvas to paint gesturally. And that's that's something that I've been working on is is trying to paint print, uh, paint more loosely, you know, lay down a value structure that can give me some confidence and then take in, you know, instead of a size six brush, maybe a size 12, a size 10, and and just have a little bit more confidence in the outset to to paint boldly. Yeah, gotcha. So, yeah, and it's it's amazing what you can do in a short amount of time. The I, I unintentionally ended up doing a 24 by 24 quick draw at Door County. And that quick was draw. I, I would not that was not planned. Try eight by eight. I know, right? So uh but oh, yeah. it, it actually ended up working fine. And it was because I had, you know, at that point I'd done so many events, had worked up to it. Kept that's the big fantastic. brushes out and painted quickly and tried to make effective decisions. <laughs> no doubt. That's fantastic. Now, outside of the quick draws with these plein air events, do you have an opportunity to say, take your larger piece, paint part of it one day, and then paint a bit of it or the rest of it the next day on location? Yes. I love working okay. in multiple sessions. So, and I'll do that at events sometimes too, where I, you know, especially if it's a place where I'm staying close to, you know, at, at Forgotten Coast, for instance, um, they often will host us right next to the beach. And so I'll do a mix of sizes and I'll do some small studies here and there, but then I might do a 20 by 30 that takes a couple of trips. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, if it's something that's nearby, it's not difficult to go out twice with a wet painting. Um, gotcha. So I, I do that quite a bit. I also love starting outside and finishing inside. <laughs> so when I'm not painting at an event, that that tends to be my MO because then I get the color and some of the like dynamic angles that I can see with shapes on location. Mm. But then I can also refine it in the studio under consistent light without all of the environmental challenges of painting plein air. And this, I guess this question kind of melts into that we just talked about. Do you deliberately plan your larger pieces by choosing certain subjects or do you refer to smaller plein air paintings to develop more involved work? And what elements do you feel are crucial for larger pieces? I think for larger ones, it's common line between that and what makes a compelling small painting. And it is design. So when, mm. when you are standing across the room from a painting, whether it is you know, 48 by 72 or I don't know, 16 by 12, the design is what will stand out and draw someone from across the room to come look closer at a specific painting. So I, I do spend time looking at design, making sure that a design that worked on a smaller scale can work on a larger scale. And if it's a really strong design, then that's that's pretty straightforward because with the larger painting, you just have more room to create interest and texture within mm -hmm. shapes, but the overall design might be really similar. So I, I do a lot of small thumbnail color studies ahead of doing a big painting. Um, I did, you know, for the solo show that I did last year, that was thematic. It was on the subject of waterfalls. I, for a couple of the larger paintings, I did three or four you know, small versions, six by eight, you know, that, that around mm -hmm. that size and just tested out different designs. You know, I had good photo reference for them, but I would, you know, I would move things around, try a different crop, try a different aspect ratio and see what stood out and, you know, what, what kind of um, which version superseded the others. And so that was a really helpful practice to get into, you know, to give it a couple scale copies before scaling up significantly. Yeah. And I guess and when it, you do those, when you do those copies, if you can lay them all out in front of you, yes. you know, you're going to be drawn to one, right? To whether oh, it's a proper value structure. And then I guess that's the one you pretty much go with. Yes. Interesting. Yes, and I keep those around and there might be elements of the other ones that I, I like, you know, if there was something about a color shift or something that I, I used in one painting that I didn't do, even in the one that I, you know, that ended up being the correct, you know, <laughs> choice for scaling up, then I might incorporate that. So every time you paint a subject, you learn something about it. True. And so it's, you're never wasting time by doing small studies in value or even small color studies. Um, because each time you 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 know kind of it, 
engage with the subject, you're learning something about it. That's great advice. Thank you. No, uh, sure. is, there, is there a place you look forward to painting that you haven't been yet? No. <laughs> probably a, uh, probably, probably lots, sure. but I think the the two top of the list, well, it's hard to pick just two, but I've always wanted to go to New Zealand and haven't been. Oh and my then God, that'd be I amazing, would, wouldn't it? It would be. Almost ended up going. Interesting question. Uh, your brights and whites are very, really vibrant. Do you have any tips on how to achieve this? Yes. Um, well, I use Michael Harding oil paint, so the, your quality of paint will make a difference. But one thing that I do frequently outside and in the studio, um, when I'm painting a la prima, you can almost create kind of a luminous glazing quality to your highlights by laying down the opaque white and then taking a transparent pigment very lightly with, you know, with a softer brush and pulling the transparent pigment over and into the, the white you know, whatever white shape is on the canvas. And so instead of pre-mixing some of my highlights, I'll actually take some transparent pigment over the white. And it's it's the same effect as glazing or, you know, how you see luminous characteristics in watercolor. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing when you look at that is that you're, you're looking through pigment to the light bouncing off the opaque white of the paper. And in the Hudson River School paintings that look really luminous, you're looking at, you're looking through transparent layers of color glaze to light bouncing off the white underpainting. Yeah. And so you can do the same thing a la prima by, by using very transparent pigments. So that's one reason that I use, I try to do transparent pigments in my palette. And one of my favorites is Indian yellow. And with that one, the brand really matters because different brands have very different versions of Indian yellow. Um, but the Harding one's great. And it it's actually replaced a lot of the cadmiums for me. I, I still keep cadmium lemon on the palette, but I don't really need the cad deep because Indian yellow is, their Indian yellow is so vibrant that yeah. you can replace it. Um, so I, I love using transparent pigments. Magenta sure. is another one. But... So I guess the process, you, you, you lay down your opaque white and then you use another brush to mix your Indian yellow, but would you do it in a kind of a, a dry mix on the brush and then glaze it over? Or is it? Yeah, is it I just kind of keep it dry on the brush. I try to okay. keep my brushes as dry as possible, no matter what. That's another thing. I, I It comes up all the time in workshops, but people are get frustrated because they have these colors mixed on the palette that look right. And then they feel like they have mud on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And when oftentimes when I see that, the problem isn't the color mixing. It is that they are cleaning their, they're trying to keep things clean and they're trying, they're cleaning their brushes with Gamsol in between each brush stroke. And once, once that solvent starts getting into your paint, it's going to cause your paint to slide around on the canvas. And that's especially the case if you're working on a smoother substrate. Yeah. So if you, yeah. so, you know, so they have trouble putting paint on paint kind of thing, right? Right. So I do not, I do not dip into Gamsol at all. Interesting. Once I'm past the initial stage of a painting. What so about I, a medium? I, I will sometimes use walnut oil or, you know, or sometimes like linseed oil with sand oil mixed, but I tend to not thin the paint very much. What I do it, instead of, instead of, uh, you know, cleaning my brush, I just take a paper towel and like squeeze the paint off the brush and clean it that way after each brush stroke. Yeah. So I guess and you would definitely then have a brush for kind of your lights, your mids and your darks. Exactly. Yeah. I'll have yeah. a couple different brushes going in each size. I'll yeah. have a light and a dark version. And if I need to clean one, I'll use walnut oil typically and try to, I try to pull most of it off. Yeah. But yeah, the Gamsol is a lot worse than walnut oil for, for making things get slippery and runny. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. I've, and it, if a little bit of one color ends up in another color, that's fine. What you don't want is a surface where you can't really lay down a brush stroke and have it sit on top. And if you're carving into subsequent layers, that's how you end up with mud. Yeah, so, that's right, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's something I, I, I see it a lot. And then, you know, it, it's it's funny because it's always kind of a revelation to people. And I would not have noticed it except a lady brought brought it up in the first workshop I ever taught. Um, she hmm. said, 
you're not cleaning your brushes. <laughs> I was like, oh, I do at the end. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I had never even thought about it, but I, I was just in the practice of not cleaning brushes during the process of painting. And Interesting. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you, in the end, you get cleaner color too, right? <laughs> That's cool. It's counterintuitive, but yes, yeah, because that Gamsol, once it gets into the paint, it will really thin things to a point that it will, it gets slippery on the canvas and it's just, yeah. it, you can't lay down a stroke on top of a really slick passage without, without creating some mud. Huh. Good tips. Good tips. Now, when you go, I know I'm focusing a lot on plein air painting, you know, you do a lot of uh, studio stuff, but when you go out, is your intent really to make a painting? Right, right then and there, or is the idea more of a study of the moment, color notes, value notes, etc., so that when you bring it back, you have that memory and experience along with your reference photos to ensure you can go larger? Yes. Well, it's kind of both and. I think it depends on the context a little bit. You know, when I'm at a plein air event, obviously mm -hmm. I am trying to create a finished painting because it yeah. will be framed at the end of the week. So <laughs> there's, there's that. But yeah, if I'm painting, if I'm painting plein air for myself, there is a lot less pressure to create something that feels like a finished piece. And, and that, that's kind of good and bad. I mean, I think the, the plus side is that if the light changes pretty radically, I don't feel any pressure to stay on site and try to finish it, making things up. But yeah, so I, when I'm plein air painting just for the purpose of, of taking something back into the studio later, then I try to get down quick color notes and I try to look at that interesting shapes. One thing I've noticed is that when I am drawing or painting on location versus using a photograph later, I often kind of create more interesting diagonals and I'll pull shapes from different, you know, different sections of the landscape. And I, I get more creative about that on site than I do when I'm working from a photo. Yeah. And so that's something I'm I'm working on right now, trying to trying to be creative with shapes, even when I'm using just photo reference, because it's it's harder when you're just looking at a two dimensional photo, to to kind of think, okay, how can I make you know make this angle more interesting? How can I create a diagonal here to emphasize movement? Yeah, there, you just feel less flexibility, I guess, when you're you know looking at a at a photo. So yeah, the the temptation is always to get tied to the to the reference, and I think plein air painting can be really instructive in terms of knowing that that reference is not the end all and be all. And That's right. You yeah. Don't have to replicate what you see. It's a lot more instinctual too, because I think when you're outside and you got your hour hour and a half, you think. Okay, I have that there. I got to put it in. You need to stroke it in, and it, it's done. You don't think about it again. Whereas you're in, exactly. when you're in the studio, it's like, oh, I, okay, that's not right. You, you maybe you're just <laughs> you can overthinking it, right? Indefinitely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Good lead into the next question is for your studio pieces. How do you know you're done? Yeah, that's always a good question. I mean, I I find that what I do is I take a lot more time towards the ending stage of a painting because once once I hit that point, there's there are so many times where I have a passage in a painting that I like and I think, oh, it just needs this and maybe this and this. And then I step back after 30 minutes and oh no, you know, <laughs> it's lost something about the, you know, the, the vibrance that it had at a half hour before. So I, I try to, to step back a lot. And then I, one thing I also do is I look in a mirror. So I keep a pocket mirror in my apron. I also have a mirror set up behind my easel, you know, behind me in the studio. So I can turn around and look at the painting in reverse and think, okay, does it really need that brush stroke? Does it need a color note here that I'm thinking about? And looking at a painting in reverse is almost like looking at someone else's work or having a fresh eye. You know, you've probably had the experience of stepping away from the canvas for a couple of days, coming back and thinking, oh, wow, how did I not see that? <laughs> but yeah, having a mirror accessible is really helpful. And I, I keep one on me plein air painting too. So I can look at a painting in reverse and think, okay, what does it really need what I'm thinking about adding? Does yeah. it, you know, how is this shape comp um, comparing to the shape next to it? And most of those questions are really about avoiding repetition. I mean, you want to create harmony in a painting, but you don't want to be repetitive with angles and shapes because variety is what makes something visually interesting. 
So I, yeah, when I, when I paint, I always keep a, a mirror around to look at things in reverse. It is pretty funny to onlookers when I do that plein air painting, because <laughs> <laughs> I had one person come up and think that I was really struggling to take a selfie. Because <laughs> so I was holding this pocket mirror up and like looking at it. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, eh? When you don't know, you don't know, right? Oh my gosh. I, I guess it's a balance between freshness and risk in a sense, mm -hmm. right? For finishing your pieces yes well and freshness is not so much about working quickly as it is about limiting the number of brush strokes you use yeah. um and yeah that that was something i learned pretty early on because i loved Sargent so much and yeah. you know reading about his process where he would redo the same brush stroke 12 times and you know yeah. go up and, and scrape it out and then try it again and the whole, whole thing was to create the impression of freshness yeah. and it's you know his work is fresh because he kept he would try the same brush stroke multiple times over and finally finally nail it so it's really more about creating that impression mm -hmm. of immediacy or, or freshness than it, it is actually working fast that's right so yeah. I, I find that yeah taking taking time and looking back in the mirror and decide you know thinking okay I want to be economical about my brush stroke choices and if i if i you know decide to do something here i don't want to if, if i have a successful brush stroke i don't want to repeat it right next door because then all of a sudden it loses its interest <laughs> so, that's right that's right and yep. i think um people who really love other artists who paint loosely i don't think they appreciate the conscious effort <laughs> painters that paint loosely put into their works and if you go onto youtube and search for kathleen hudson uh one of the videos with Eric Rhodes about uh, painting water comes up. Mm -hmm. And if you watch that, you're, you're painting the foreground water, but what you're doing is each stroke is put down deliberately based on your reference photo. But each time you go to the palette, it's always changing a little bit. And then when your stroke goes on a little different again and again and again, and that's how it builds up that freshness instead of just kind of washing everything in as one value, right? Right. So, so great thing to watch if you're jump on the YouTube and type in Kathleen Hudson. Absolutely. Yeah. The freshness thing is all about creating the impression of, yeah. of that. And I actually like that process more because it feels like putting together a puzzle. So instead of kind of noodling with something until it looks mostly right, it's you're thinking a couple steps ahead. It's almost more like chess where you're yeah. you have to you have to like take think think a few steps ahead and think, okay, if I do this, you know, brush stroke here. And, and and have this big sweeping one how can i you know how can i balance it out on the other side so you know you're putting together kind of this interesting visual puzzle when you're creating a painting that's, that's a great way to the put more it. practice you get you know the more that will come as second nature you know not every you don't, every brushstroke shouldn't feel like a a challenge you know it's not it's not a pressure like a <laughs> it's not a yeah. negative thing but, but yeah, learn, you know, thinking about how to create variation yeah. and yeah, and how to create dynamism. Like those are something I, I do think about those with every brush stroke. And then, yeah. you know, it, it starts looking fresh the more you practice that. Yeah. Yeah. They say the key to a good painting is variety, 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 right? Very true. Yeah. Simplify <laughs> it, right? We're coming close to the end. Well, very close to the end. I have two questions I'd like to ask at the end. And the first one being, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, um, man, that, that is a tough one. I would say probably that you don't learn from trying to finish every painting because when I started painting, I was really a details person. Some of it came from starting in watercolor where if you mess up, then <laughs> shows over. But I, yeah, I started painting, you know, with tiny brushes, lots of detail, very, religiously yeah. adhering to the reference image and knowing that I didn't actually have, you know, if, if something wasn't working, I would spend weeks on the same small painting, trying to get it to a place where I liked it. And I, and I still have a couple of those paintings from high school in, uh, you know, I'm sure they're in a closet somewhere. And it's, it's so funny to think about the amount of hours I poured into those when I could have been doing small color studies mm -hmm. and, doing small value studies on location and I would have learned a lot faster. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, my advice that, and I, I re repeat that to students all the time is to, you know, to keep starting, do, do lots and lots of small starts 
And the ones that are exciting to you, go ahead and carry those through, but do not feel like you need to torture yourself to try yeah. to finish something that isn't working for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think once you learn that or accept that, it's a lot more freeing too, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just so over those old canvases and it's kind Absolutely. of nice. <laughs> Yeah, have, a, have a bonfire. Clean start, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. And the last question, I hope the answer is different though, is what's the best piece of advice you can give others? Yes. I I would say to show yourself a lot of grace when it comes to your growth and technique, you know, and skill over time. Expect that to take some time, expect it to take practice, but f- know that your greatest growth will probably come from when you are painting something you are really excited about. So go into museums, go outside into nature, if you paint landscape and think about what it is that really inspires you. And that's going to be different for every person, but think about, think about what inspires you when you walk into a museum, when you walk into a gallery, when you see somebody else's work, you know, if you, if you develop a habit of asking yourself what you know, what it is that speaks to you most, go ahead and chase that in your subject matter, then it will be a lot easier to stay inspired. And it's okay if you don't like painting still life. It's okay. If if there are subjects that don't speak to you, that's fine. Don't feel like you have to force yourself to do that. Go, go paint what you really love. And then all of the other stuff, you know, the practice will fall into place. So that's, that would, you know, that's what I tell workshop students because, you know, when people get frustrated, it, it's a lot easier to get over the hump if you're in a beautiful place or you're doing something you're excited about. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, right? You know, slogging through a subject that doesn't speak to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a great piece of advice. Thank you very much. And if you want to check out Kathleen, of course, she's at KathleenBHudson.com and uh, Kathleen B. Hudson on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about Artful Minds, we're at artfulminds.ca. And if you want to see more inspirational videos that we've done previously, go to community powerfulminds.ca. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for this interview. I was uh, so pleased when you said yes. I just I thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a joy. And to everyone who came as well and asked your questions. Thank you very much, everybody. You're what keep me going. So <laughs> excellent. All right. Thank you to your kids. And I hope you have a great day. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you much, everybody. Bye, everyone. Take care.